Hey, listen, I've, uh, I won't lie, I've heard the rumors, the whispers out in the deep, dark corners of the internet, the ludicrous assumptions, the lies, the, the slander. I know you've all been thinking about it, so let's just get this out of the way. Jeremy, what does your keys rig look like? Well, I guess today is the day that I will attempt to answer some of those questions for you. I won't lie, I tried to record this video outside and it was so noisy and everybody decided that on this beautiful Saturday sunny afternoon they had to do lawn work and ride motorcycles directly around my house. So here we are in the warm lonesome of my room recording this video. I hope you enjoy Jeremy James Whitaker's nonchalant, extremely casual, non-confrontational keys rig overview for the setup at IHOP KC and at Grace Point Community Church in Lee Summit. Firstly, this video will cover uh, more gear and plugins um, than anything else. And I won't really explain too much in depth of each individual thing. I'll just give a brief overview. And then uh, in future videos, if you guys requested in the comments, I will, I'll try and cover more in depth details in other videos in the future. I'll also say that this is different than a studio setup. To my left, I have all my studio gear, but I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff because the stuff I'd use for a live setting and a studio setting would be completely different. You would use some of the tools here and there, but for the most part, everything that I have chosen for a live setting is for a specific reason. Lastly, I'll say that this is not the standard for Keys Rig. This is just what I use. What I find to be the most user-friendly and adaptable to the scenarios that I find myself in on a daily basis at the prayer room and at church. So here we go. Um, key thing to know going in, keys rigs, apart from electric guitar rigs, can be some of the more expensive instruments on stage in a worship setting. You're going to have to invest in a lot of stuff. My old worship leader, Brandon Oaks, one time told me that it's better to invest in gear that will take you a long way than to go for the less expensive and honestly less reliable gear. So a lot of this stuff might be out of your price range and it's fine to begin on some of these less expensive and way more beginner friendly softwares and plugins and physical interfaces, MIDI controllers, whatever. But eventually you're gonna wanna invest in yourself if you wanna go pretty far in being a keys player. So that's it, let's get into the gear. I'm gonna split this into two different categories. The first will be physical gear and the second will be plugins and software gear. So let's go. Um, first thing here is keys players nowadays have to have a laptop. They have to have a laptop that runs a lot of software and a lot of keys players nowadays use a MacBook Pro. Preferably something with, well I'm just going to describe the specs on the one that I use. 8 gigabytes of RAM at least, an i7 processor at least, and an SSD hard drive at least. Those things will help your computer be able to process audio in a quicker fashion because in a live setting, keys players are often sending out a lot of different audio from a lot of different places on your hard drive and in your computer. And your computer needs to be able to handle all of that. So that's laptops. Um, as far as keyboards, um, the International House Prayer, which is about 250 yards that way, has Yamaha CP300s for pretty much the standard of what you'll use at the prayer room, at their church property, and at the International House Prayer University, which is the school I teach at. They're a little older, but they are extremely reliable, great MIDI sensitivity, and they last for a very long time. As far as interfaces, let me actually see if I can, yep, it's right over here. Oh, okay. So I use a PreSonus Studio 1810 interface, really reliable, has a lot of inputs and outputs. Usually with an interface, you're going to want to aim for at least six outputs. Um, this has six outputs and 10 inputs, geez. The reason I say six outputs is because a lot of times keys players are going to want to split their audio between keys channels. So that's going to be a lot of your pianos, your, so your electric pianos, a lot of your lead sounds loops channels, um, which is a lot of your pads, a lot of your more ambient sounds, and a lot of your samples, loops, and all that kind of stuff, and then uh, a mono channel for a metronome. So I'd at the very least aim for six stereo channels where you can actually split one of them off into a mono metronome click channel. Two more things on the physical gear. Let me, let me grab this over here. Thankfully I have all my gear with me today. Um, a MIDI controller 
like one like this is going to be really valuable for playing as a keys player as you need to make a lot of adjustments on the fly. And controllers like this, this is a Akai MIDI mix. Um, a lot of controllers like this will enable you to customize your scene and be able to make changes on the fly um, using the last piece of physical software. Um, I'll, I'll just say this, um, vitally important to being able to do stuff in the moment rather than having to scroll through your mouse and try to find settings to change. That last piece of physical software is going to be Ableton Live 11. This is kind of the most important piece of the puzzle when it comes to playing keys. Ableton Live 11 is what's known as a DAW or a digital audio workstation. There's a few other DAWs that are like Ableton, like Logic and Mainstage that are going to be perfectly fine for playing keys. However, in my context, I find Ableton is miles ahead of everything else in terms of its ability to run stuff in a live setting where you can loop parts, where you can run the metronome, where you can actually load in full scenes of audio for stems or samples or whatever like that. Ableton is kind of a cut above the rest and it's kind of the standard for what a lot of people like to use uh, in my community that I'm in as well as probably uh, besides main stage being one of the other ones that a lot of people use. Those are the two that uh, are the most popular in keys playing in a worship setting. And make sure you have a MIDI cable, a 5 pin MIDI. Um, that little guy right there is a MIDI input and output. It's, I don't know if it's focusing or not, but um, that enables your interface to connect to your computer and actually receive signal from your keyboard, sending it through the interface to your computer so it can control sounds. Now that we've mentioned that and Ableton, which is the first piece of software, let's talk about everything that's not physical. Let's talk about plugins. Uh, I already mentioned Ableton, so I won't go over that again. Plugins are basically the things that are housed inside of your digital audio workstation that you can have everything gathered into uh, one place so you can play all of it all at once. These plugins are uh, really easy to find, really easy to use um, for the most part. If you have any background in producing and in sound design, you'll love some of these plugins. And some of them are going to be a lot harder to get a hold of from a beginner's standpoint. So I would recommend maybe holding off on some of these until you are a little bit more experienced with keys playing so you can kind of navigate your way around live sound design. So I'll break these down into three different sections. The first of which is keys, actual pianos, keys based plugins, which the most popular that I've ever found to be uh, one that pretty much everyone around the IHOP community uh, uses is Alicia's Keys, which is a Yamaha C7 sampled in piano. It was made in 2010 and to this date I have not really experienced a grand piano, or it's in that case it's a mini grand, Yamaha C7 grand piano that um, sounds more authentic, sounds like your ear is legitimately next to the shell of the piano, sounds like you can hear the strings on it, it's just, it's, a, it's an immense plug-in. Alicia's Keys from Native Instruments, crazy good grand piano. Along with, um, I really love to use something called Unicorda, by, also by Native Instruments. Um, it's a great sound design piano, it can give you a lot of texture, but the thing I love about it the most is the soft felt piano texture that it can bring and it is it is crazy intimate sounding it sounds powerful and full without being overpowering so those are the two main piano plugins that i use other other ones the maverick uh the noir um both of those are native instruments and then the soft piano from spitfire labs are also other really great piano sounds last for the key section i'll say is electric pianos are often going to be a, a central piece to your keys rig and so the one I use is the Mark 1 from Addictive Keys and it is crazy versatile, sounds authentic, does not sound synthesized, does not sound electronic at all. Um, it, it is perfect for intimate moments and then you can ramp up the velocity, sensitivity and all that for more hype dynamics. So it's, it's perfect. Okay, I'm going to move into pads and synths. This is a little bit of a tough one because a lot of people in the community that I'm in use Omnisphere and Omnisphere 2. I love both of those plugins. They're really bulky. You're going to have to have a really powerful CPU, which was the first reason that I actually didn't get into it. But the second reason is um, I'm so used to some of these other plugins from my producing background that I decided to actually bring those into a live setting. And I found that for me, they work a little bit better, though I'm not going to say they're better than Omnisphere or Omnisphere 2. The, those are some amazing plugins that have crazy sound design sample libraries and I'm sure if you use those you will 
be more than satisfied. As for me, I've been using serum from Xfer for years now, and I can kind of craft anything I want out of that synthesizer. It's a wavetable plug-in synthesizer, and it's not too bulky on your CPU. And it's one of those plugins where if you can hear it in your mind's ear, you can you can make it. It's 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 a great plugin. I can go more into depth on that later. Along with that, we have Native Instruments Massive, which is a classic. It's it's kind of an older plugin now, but it's all reliable. Um, a lot of the sounds that I made when I started playing keys and started getting into production were made in Massive, and and it's been a staple for a really long time. Those are both synth and lead line and bass and arpeggiator things that I that I love uh, you can also create pads for them which are which are really great and full I'll mention uh, felt instruments leco which is actually you'd say Jeremy that's a piano plugin and you would be right except that they've added sound design elements that are crazy texture heavy that sound amazing uh, as pads and as tonal pads and so I, I love Leco by Feld Instruments, highly recommend it. Um, lastly, I'll just say that Ableton's stock plugins have gotten so much better over the years. Initially in Ableton 9 or something like that, they weren't very intuitive. Ableton 10 brought in this plugin called Wavetable. That is such a versatile instrument inside of Ableton uh, and it's not going to be CPU heavy at all and you can do a lot with it, importing your own sounds, whatever. It's so useful. And then Ableton 11 has ramped up the more random, natural, texture-based plugins. They have a new pack um, with Ableton 11 called Nature Inspired, I think that's what it's called. And it, it's crazy cool for getting some unplanned but very useful sound design textures. So keep that in mind. Don't skip on the stock stuff. It's It, it can all be very good. Strings. Um, you're going to use those a lot in worship environments and for me the thing I found most useful has been East West Studios Hollywood solo strings and specifically their solo cello. It is so rich and powerful and it, it feels so good and intimate. It feels real. It does not feel cardboard like a lot of other plug-in virtual instrument cellos. The very last thing is um, I just want to highlight two effects both from Valhalla. Um, their Valhalla Reverb um is amazing and the Valhalla Supermassive is a delay that kind of acts like a reverb if you play with the modulation those two um are really cool for just getting some unplanned sounds out of your instruments so keep those in mind anyways i think that's it um if you have questions feel free to drop them below and if you have things that i missed that you want to hear go ahead and leave a comment i'll I pretty much read every one since there's only like 10 of you who will watch this and find it useful. So it's almost guaranteed that I'll answer your questions. Anyways, here comes that YouTube line. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel for more videos like this and more playful ones obviously in the future. And guys, I've never said this before, hit that bell. I don't really know what it does. I think it notifies you if I do videos, but I promise I won't annoy you too much. I'm only really planning on doing like a video once a week. So anyways, thank you guys so much. I will see y'all later. Bye. Bye.